general relativity, step by step. I'm going to spend uh, the next few screencasts talking about gravitational waves. Gravitational waves. Ripples in space-time. And as I speak in 2017, gravitational waves have been detected on Earth. And I think that's pretty cool. You can actually actually detect uh, merging uh, black holes, which, which I think is pretty, pretty cool. Gravitational waves, ripples in space-time. I was flicking through my copy of Misner, Thorne and Wheeler the other day, and I came across a wonderful quote. They said that to understand any system of equations or any complicated equation, the way to do it, the general way to do it, is to consider one idealization after another one. So you consider a sequence of simplifying assumptions that allow you not to solve the full equations, but to solve some simple case of the equations that you're considering. And of course, the equations that we're considering are the, the field equations, and I've got them written down here in, in two different forms. Um, we spent quite a long time considering stationary solutions, stationary vacuum solutions of the field equations with an imposed spherical symmetry. And of course, we've got black holes, so we've got the Schwarzschild, um, the Schwarzschild metric out of that. What I'm going to do is consider a different, um, a different idealization that gives us general, uh, that gives us gravitational waves. So basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to strip away lo large parts of the complexity of this system, and I'm going to do it in stages. I'm just going to assert that that equals zero, on the grounds that my um, Stress energy tensor is equal to zero, and I'm going to ignore the cosmological constant as well. So I'm just left with my uh, statement of the, the Ricci tensor being equal to zero. In fact, I'm going to consider vacuum solutions. But I'm going to consider something else. I'm going to consider a much more profound simplification of the field equations. I'm going to consider only the linear case. I'm going to consider perturbations to space-time which are linear in a sense which I'll define very precisely. So what we're going to do is we're going to start out with the metric tensor g mu nu and I'm going to assume that that is equal to eta mu nu plus h mu nu. Where, so this is the metric tensor. This thing here is the Minkowski metric, Minkowski, which of course is minus one zero 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 one zero 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 one zero. Oops, I'm not sure what happened there. Zero zero one zero 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 one plus this thing h, which is small. So my linearization is to consider a small perturbation on flat space. Um, yeah, a small perturbation on flat space. The crucial observation is that the Minkowski metric is constant. So it's constant plus small. G mu nu is a sum of a constant thing and a small thing. And I will use these two facts over and over and over again to give us linear solutions, in a sense which I'll make precise, uh, to the oh to the to the vacuum field equations here. Let me just clarify what I mean by small. Um, small here, well, it's got a sort of mathematical meaning, but the, the type, the, the order of magnitude I'm considering is about 10 to the minus 21. So, uh, the, 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 the size of the elements, the modulus of h mu nu, is approximately 10 to the minus 21, which means that if I've got a term of order that squared, which is 10 to the minus 42, I can just ignore that. So I'm only going to retain terms of the first order. Retain terms of the first order. Sometimes you'll see me talking about higher order terms. Order terms. Uh, which is this one here, 10 to the minus 42, which I'm just going to ignore. OK, so what can we say? We've got the metric tensor is a constant plus something small. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to write that out again. Mu nu equals eta mu nu plus something small. The fiction we're going to maintain is that this is like a tensor. 
and it's like in inverted commas. What I mean by like is that if we retain terms of only the first order, if we ignore higher order terms, then it does indeed transform in the same way as a second order tensor. But I'm going to prove that and demonstrate that and, and, and show you how it works in subsequent screencasts. I'm going to stop there. Stop.